In response to an obnoxiously common attitude that science is all about truth and reality and all those good things, this is the first in a video series that attempts to explain some problems with that Pollyanna-ish idea. That actually science is a philosophy that tries to build a coherent model of how the world works with empirical evidence. But that it is done by human beings who have flaws and biases and who tend to impose unwarranted levels of certainty on certain interpretations. And then in particular, we tend to attach greater meaning to conclusions that favor conformity to cultural assumptions on the evidence. We also have a framework or lens through which we view the world, and we tend to take it for granted. For instance, I have scientific training in neurobiology, genetics, development, and in evolution, and I'm also an atheist with an ultimately reductionist perspective. There is nothing but matter, energy, and information in the universe. That means I'm perpetually tempted to just assume phenomena can be distilled down to interactions between atoms. And I definitely am confident and believe that that is true. But what I can't justify is the assumption that we, as scientists and human beings, know how all those interactions work. We don't. The one thing we know for sure is that they'll be far more complex than we expect, and that there will be surprising and unpredicted side effects and causal connections. Far too many people confuse science, which is a process for investigating reality, with reality itself. This is quickly going to become a tangled argument, because in addition, our modern culture tends to favor scientific explanations, so it's really easy to get in a loop. Scientists search for evidence that, for instance, our culture is the superior human culture, and then society turns around and claims that the idea that their culture is superior has now been reinforced by science, which then increases the incentive for scientists to bol bolster that bias. And it goes on and on until you've got loud nitwits in the public sphere proudly announcing that it's a scientific fact that Africans have an average IQ of 70. This is not to argue that flat earthers and creationists or scientific racists have valid points or that science is merely a matter of opinion. They don't, and it isn't. And there are levels of certainty, and the age and shape of the earth are not debatable conclusions. But some aspects of science have acquired a kind of epistemic arrogance that has been seized upon by certain deplorable aspects of our society as an excuse to make extreme claims of confidence for what are actually unsupportable claims and are using those claims to complete the loop and propose some ugly changes to our social environment. I'm going to start off gently with a topic that probably won't shock you or trigger raging denunciations from the status quo warriors of YouTube. Let's talk about a simple phenomenon that tends to get painted with unfortunate levels of genetic determinism. The instigation for this video is my curiosity about arachnophobia. I seem to totally lack it, and am instead fascinated by spiders. But when I started showing off videos of my current research interest in the lovely Parastea toda tepidariorum, I got comments and complaints from people who blanched when they saw a mere picture of a spider. How interesting, I thought. I wonder why people have such deeply different views on something as common as an ordinary resident of our houses. I wanted to look this up, not because I wanted to justify throwing close-up photos of spiders at people who didn't want to see them, but because I honestly wondered how this kind of phobia could arise. So I turned to the scientific literature and other sources and tried to find out what the root causes were. I was not surprised to find some sober and reasonable explanations in the scientific literature, but what was disturbing was how rapidly the explanations drifted into absurd genetic de determinism the farther you went from this serious work in neurobiology. Oddly, while the scientific literature is rather ambiguous and acknowledges that phobias are a complex phenomenon, as you move into pop psychology magazines, the reported frequency of arachnophobia begins to rise, and you get more and more articles telling you it is a primordial response in evolution and has a significant genetic component. By the time you get to the tabloids, you've got nonsense like phobias, maybe memories passed down in genes from ancestors, and humans are hardwired to fear their angular legs and unpredictability. The various popular science websites aren't immune either. We really are born with a natural fear of spiders and snakes, new study shows, says Science Alert. I read the study... No, it doesn't show that. It's not a bad bit of research. It shows that a small sample of six-month-old babies show a stronger pupillary response to spiders than to flowers. But it's being overinterpreted. Tech Times is even worse at describing the same paper. Researchers uncover genetic roots of fear of spiders. No genes were examined in the study. No genetic analysis at all was done. How can you talk about genetics when they didn't even look at heritability or familial relationships? Another strategy is to invoke evolution, specifically selection. Spiders are a threat. They're dangerous. 
Therefore, it was advantageous to have a strong, aversive response to them, and we can assume that nature has equipped us with an automatic danger avoidance mechanism in arachnophobia. One of my sources even says this. One prominent theory states that early on in human evolution, spiders posed a threat, so we've developed a sort of hair-trigger reaction to them. Curiously, while it's called a prominent theory, they don't provide a reference. It is simply assumed that spiders have posed a threat, and that, of course, natural selection has saved us from it. One problem with the theory, though, is that spiders are not and have not ever been a serious threat. There are venomous spiders that have the potential to do people harm, But the thing is, they don't have any interest in biting people. People are not their prey. People sometimes try to harm spiders, sometimes as a byproduct of arachnophobia, which leads to them getting bitten in self-defense. But honestly, they are an inconsequential hazard. I tried looking into the spider-caused death statistics. One problem is that they're so rare. You'll sometimes see the number six thrown around, as in, there are about six deaths from venomous spiders in the U.S. in a year, but even that falls apart when you examine it closely. One of the scariest spiders around the U.S. is Latrodectus, the black widow spider. You're supposed to fear that red hourglass. But there are only three, count them, three reports of deaths by black widow envenomation in the entire world medical literature in all of recorded history. None of them have occurred in the U.S. Another so-called deadly spiders are the South American wandering spiders. How many fatalities have they caused? 10. Not 10 per year, not 10 per month, only 10 in the entire recorded history of Brazil. 10 is not nothing, and be very wise to avoid the risk of being bitten by phonutria, but it's clearly not a danger that should make Brazilians tremble in fear. That Bolsonaro primate running the country is far scarier and will will end up killing far more people than spiders do. The Australian redback is a relative of the black widow, and as we all know, everything in Australia is trying to kill you. So I was a little surprised to find this headline from 2016. Young man is first to die from spider bite in Australia for 37 years. The poor man actually died from an infected spider bite, not the venom. So there is that. A general aversion to biting arthropods is a useful property. They hurt, they can lead to infection, even tiny creatures can cause deadly infections. But mosquitoes kill a million people every year. In the general category of entomophobia, it seems strange to single out one group, the spiders, with a specific label of arachnophobia, especially when you consider that spiders kill mosquitoes, which kill millions, or to think that we've evolved a genetically determined response to a specific organism in the absence of any selective advantage. Being bad at risk assessment is not a sound foundation for an adaptive explanation. I mean, we have strong evidence that leopards were significant predators of our hominin ancestors with traces of big cats gnawing on their skulls. We know that even today, leopards are dangerous to baboon and chimpanzee troops. Shouldn't we, by that logic, have allurophobia burned into our genome? But no, instead we become raging allurophiles. No one has ever, as far as I know, sent a worried and regretful email to a website owner asking them to please stop showing so many pictures of cats because it makes them queasy. Allurophobia seems to fade easily into allurophilia, which ought to tell you something about the malleable and experiential nature of these things that some people would like you to believe are hardwired by an inbuilt ancestral and genetic memory. Does this imply that there's no genetic foundation for phobias, or that I believe people are blank slates or infinitely malleable? Social constructionists don't like evolutionary psychologists and they don't like biology. And I I, I really don't understand why, except that it interferes with this idea that human beings are infinitely malleable and stops them from being able to blame hierarchy on the West. That common caricature of people who don't accept the omnipotence of genes? No, not at all. There is good evidence there are genetic predispositions to some kinds of phobias, but that they're the product of both genetic factors and experience. And also that they're not quite as specific as some have argued. That there may be a general predisposition to animal phobias, for instance, but that fears of specific animals are shaped by personal histories. So someone might inherit a tendency to shy away from animals in general, but could have had a happy childhood with beloved pets and be totally into working at the Humane Society. Someone else could totally lack any genetic bias to fear animals, but after a single intense traumatic experience with bats, he grows up to be Batman. Here, for instance, are the results of a twin study done in over 4,000 twin pairs in Virginia to assess the heritability and environmental influences on various phobias. I know it's a complicated tangle of numbers, but all you have to know is that both genetics and environmental effects are important in every one of the phobias. 
They went further and looked for correlations between phobias. For example, is there just one heritable phobia proneness trait? Or is each one of these independent and specifically regulated? And found that neither extreme is true. They found four rough clusters of traits that imply perhaps four general causes. Arachnophobia is part of a correlated package that includes other animal phobias, like fear of bugs, mice, and bats, and also, interestingly, includes social agoraphobic fears. We're all just animals, I guess. Again, remember that the causes are multifactorial. You could have a genetic bias to like animals in social situations and still have been conditioned to fear spiders. There's another level to this story, many levels in fact, and that is the difficulty of translating genetic information into the organization of the nervous system. The genome is most definitely not a blueprint. It does not specify, for instance, the morphology of brain nuclei. There is no map of the connectivity of the brain somewhere in the genome. Rather, the genes establish a pattern of potential responsive cells to environmental stimuli. And the final pattern emerges as a consequence of mostly roughly predictable interactions between genes, cells, and the environment. I'm always stopped cold at statements about how something as specific as recognition and fear of spiders can be encoded in the genome. It's challenging enough to see how a network of genes can generate the rough outlines of a brain, setting up reward and fear nuclei and pathways, without proposing that a search image of a specific kind of organism can be propagated through the complex and mostly indirect series of cellular interactions that end in the result of clusters of cells and pathways. Fortunately, neurobiology doesn't make such claims. Rather, the models for phobias involve development of a common neurological substrate for fear processing in the brain. Substrates like the basolateral amygdala, connections to the locus ceruleus, and connections to the nucleus of the solitary tract, all generating and receiving endocrine signals. The brain builds complex circuits that interact to create a general property we call fear, and we could speculate endlessly about what fear means to an organism, and we can imagine that there is some degree of variability in the sensitivity of these circuits that lead to individual variation. The consensus is that the specific details of a phobia are fine-tuned by experience. There isn't a specific spider phobia, but there may be a general predisposition in some individuals to have, for instance, a disgust response to cont contamination, small animals, vermin, etc., that can be shaped by history and events in an individual's life. There is a non-experiential innate fear that is a product of common neuronal circuitry and found in essentially all human beings. There is some degree of variation in the circuitry. Some individuals will be more or less sensitive to the activation of this ne network, and others will vary in how readily they habituate to fear stimuli. There is a normal and healthy level of function. Sure, you should be hesitant to handle a spider or a creature unfamiliar to you. That's what this circuitry is for. There are also levels of dysfunction. Failure of this network can lead to non-adaptive embrace of dangerous novelty. Hey, baby. While hyperactivation can lead to self-destructive excessive reactions to relatively harmless stimuli, like arachnophobia or PTSD. Most fears and the degree of our responses to them are experiential. They involve modulation of the common fear circuits by our experiences in history. But they are no less real for that. We have plastic brains that respond to our environment and generate physical changes in our nervous systems that are just as significant and just as genuine as the wiring we're born with. I was not born loving my wife and children. I was born with a capacity to love, and who and how I learned to love certain individuals was constructed. That doesn't make them less real. You can no more tell someone that their fear of spiders is an epiphenomenon, something that is generated by their experience and therefore inconsequential, than you can tell me that my love for my kids is epiphenomenological and can be easily overridden. Experience is real. Your feelings are valid. Whether they're hardwired or learned is irrelevant to their significance to the individual. Science doesn't and shouldn't favor one or the other, especially since the lessons of genetics and neurobiology and development have been clear that genes and environment are tangled in a feedback loop that makes it impossible to dissociate one from the other. It is ironic that the people who are paying the loudest lip service to a reductionist version of science fail to recognize how much of their bias is emotional. These are facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. Facts don't care about your feelings. It's true, they don't. What is not being taken into account is that feelings are also facts that have to be addressed. Feelings are physiological. They are part of the equation, and maybe the biggest part. There's less genetic variation between people than there is cultural and personal, 
Yet somehow we've ended up in a situation where the primacy of a narrow and conclusively false interpretation of human nature is labeled scientific, while the richer, deeper, more complex knowledge of humanity that has been assembled by, by biologists, psychologists, sociologists, and anthropologists is dismissed as politically and ideologically motivated feelings by an assortment of science denialists and anti-science propagandists. This is what I find fascinating. In popular culture, there's a kind of general drift towards claiming genetic determinism as a scientific fact. We shift from an observable fact that some people do have a genuine and honest fear of spiders to an unsupported opinion that arachnophobia is a genetic condition. And we ignore all the science that says it's a product of experience shaping a general neuronal substrate to favor this harder version of the explanation that privileges the notion that it's a genetic trait. Why? I have a couple of potential explanations. One is that science has become the undeniable authority on reality. It is the new God did it. You don't have to actually know any science to be able to just use the claim that science says to justify your opinion, no matter what it is. Just as you never needed to know the actual opinion of a deity to be able to claim that he supports you. It's a handy shorthand that I'm seeing a lot of far-right, alt-right, and centrist science abusers throw around. It's particularly amazing how they can tell me that, for instance, because I reject the nonsense of pseudoscientific excuses for racism, I must therefore be a creationist. Second is that there's a twisted idea of responsibility here. You can't help what you're born with, but if you have an acquired disability, well, that's your fault, and you are fair game for discrimination. You're afraid of spiders? Too bad. Here's a bucket of them. Get over it. I've witnessed people mocking others for PTSD. People with no qualifications in psychology or medicine, with distorted ideas about what PTSD is or its causes, and who treat it as a sign of weakness. Acquired disorders are a sign that you are inherently flawed and you are somehow inferior, that you are damaged by nature, rather than that you've been overloaded with damaging environmental inputs, as can happen to anyone. Third, there's a sense of self-justification. I am well off. I'm not being discriminated against. The system is working well for me. While for someone else, they are poor, they are suffering, the odds are stacked against them. Which is better for my self-esteem? To claim that it must be because my genes are intrinsically superior while their genes are inferior? Or to argue that both of us are in our respective positions because of fundamental biases in our environments? It's especially troubling when we note that those environments are perpetuated by individuals with a self-interest in preserving the status quo. It's not a difference in genetics. It's that my privilege is helping to produce your disentitlement. And that's our situation. The media, politics, and popular opinion are all overrun with invalid absolutist notions of the omnipotence of genetic explanations. All I can do is try to explain why they're wrong. Simplicity and certainty are for Nazis. Complexity and nuance are for lefties and for scientists. Next in this series, I'll try to explain the confusion between alleles and traits, a confusion that scientists have contributed to repeatedly for the last hundred years.